Hello everyone and welcome to, to today's webinars, webinar, Kubernetes Security Considerations for IDS IPS in the Age of TLS version 1.3. Um, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Christopher Lillian Sope, who is the original architect behind Tigera's Project Calico. He speaks at, uh, as you can see, many, many, many meetup, meetups yearly, uh, educating people on networking and network security for modern applications and containers and using Kubernetes and other orchestrators. He also consults with uh, Tigera's enterprise clients on their security and compliance uh, for their modern applications. And so before I hand the microphone over to Christopher, I just have a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover about this presentation and the webinar platform. First, today's webinar will be available on demand immediately after the live session. Give it some processing time, but by five minutes it'll be available. Um, we've also added some attachments and links to this uh, to the presentation, which are available through the attachments tab. There you can find other related content, including a brand new Kubernetes guide to network security and uh, a link to an upcoming web a webinar. If you'd like a copy of today's slides, they will be sent to you in a separate email, uh, so, so that will be taken care of. Next, and finally, we'd like to hear from you today during today's presentation. So if you have a question, please be sure to ask the speaker. Christopher, as, as you have your questions, just go ahead and type them into the questions box and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, and without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off and hand things over to Christopher. Christopher. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. So, um, yeah, as, as Michael said, today we thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, TLS 1.3 um, and IDS and IPS in your Kubernetes cluster. Or in this really, we're, we focus this around Kubernetes, but this could be in any kind of cluster or uh, environment where you're deploying TLS. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of what I'm going to talk about for the IDS IPS is probably relevant to both, but there's some um, changes that happened in TLS 1.3 that we should be aware of uh, when we start talking about IDS and IPS. But first, let's talk a little bit about the change um, to TLS 1.3. So um, for those of you who um, aren't aware of exactly what TLS 1.3 is, uh, TLS, obviously, uh, Transport Layer Security, is the technology that's used to secure, for example, most HTTP traffic around the, around the net. And there's been a lot of move lately by the large internet infrastructure companies to drive web traffic and web UIs and uh, HTTP uh, APIs to be HTTPS or TLS enabled by default. And in fact, some browsers are now starting to show that uh, HTTP or non-encrypted uh, web sessions as uh, being called out as being insecure. So there's a big move to TLS enabling all web traffic in uh, on the internet. That's a good net positive good thing. Um, and as part of that, we've made some changes in the industry to uh, the TLS protocol itself. And that's a set by, this protocol is managed by the uh, IETF to a certain extent. And they released a new version of TLS. Uh, there are a couple of things that have been changed that are worth noting. One, we've made, uh, the industry has made TLS a faster, simpler protocol with version 1.3 versus, versus version 1.2. We removed one stage of handshakes, which obviously decreases the latency in setting up a TLS connection. And that's, you know, so from a, a performance standpoint, TLS 1.3 is inherently faster than TLS 1.2 was. Um, there's less negotiation going on. And another big change in TLS, and they came along TLS 1.3, is we stripped out all of the unsecure or insecure cryptographic algorithms or algorithms where the security of the algorithm was, was in question. So the only protocols that have ended up in TLS 1.3 are protocols that have gone through open cryptographic analysis and the industry is fairly certain are 
reasonably secure. So, you know, TLS 1.2, there was a huge menu of encryption protocols that could be um, offered up and, and negotiated for. And many of those protocols were known to be insecure. But if you had old web servers and all they could handle was the old protocols or old clients, you ended up on insecure protocols. And the only thing probably worse than not using encryption across a session is using encryption with bad uh, with, with a bad or weak encryption algorithm. It's sort of like, you know, it's, it's almost better to not have a lock on your door than have a lock on your door that's easily bumpable and, and anyone can open because you have a false sense of security. So we removed a lot of the insecure algorithms uh, or all the insecure algorithms out of TLS uh, and we that also simplified the number of algorithms that are in use and simplified the negotiation pretty much. There's only a few to pick from now. The other thing that we that's been done in TLS 1.3 is that we've um, addressed some of the downgrade issues where uh, you could actually have a strong encryption selected, but then later it gets downgraded to a weaker encryption algorithm. This was one form of attack. That's been solved. The final interesting change to TLS 1.3, from my viewpoint, is one we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about here which is something called perfect forward secrecy. And TLS 1.2 could do this, sort of, but in TLS 1.3, it's it sort of built into the protocol from day one. And the easiest way to discuss what perfect forward secrecy is, is to show you a couple of images. So why don't we go to the next image. Okay. So in this one, this is a very busy image, but let me try and, and walk you through it a little bit. So in this case, I have Alice who's trying to communicate to Bob and say Bob has a web server and Alice is a, a web client. Um, and Alice um, has a TLS certificate. This is for TLS 1.2. And the red key on that certificate is her private key. Um, and then her certificate public key she has published. So Bob knows Alice's public key and Alice has her private key and she hasn't let anyone know about that private key. It's kept uh, safely on her, on her machine. But what this allows us to do is set up a level of trust between Alice and Bob. And I'm only showing one side of the communication here. The same thing would be happening in reverse with Bob sending traffic back to Alice. But for right now, let's just keep it on one sided thing. So what happens in TLS when you try and uh, start an encrypted session is you stand up the HTTP uh, TCP session. So that's uh, SYNAC. We won't talk about that too much. And then Alice is going to generate a session key. And what a session key is, and, and in cryptography, this is important to note, that in a session key, in a cryptographic environment, the more material that you encrypt with a key, the more likely it is for somebody to be able to break that key and decrypt the traffic, especially if the traffic has a well-known pattern, say like protocol packets. So it, it's, you know, the more traffic I put under a key, the more likely it is that someone will be able to break that key. So in any long-lived session where you're passing a lot of data or it's living for a long period of time, good cryptographic practice says you change the keys used to encrypt the, the actual payload, the actual data. We call those session keys. So Alice is going to send, start sending traffic to Bob. What she's going to do is she's going to generate an ephemeral session key, and that will last for hours or a certain amount of traffic being sent uh, based on her browser or her, uh, her system settings. Now, the other thing to keep in mind in cryptography is symmetrical encryption. Encryption where both sides use the same key to encrypt and decrypt is mathematically faster than public key, private key encryption, uh, substantially. So if Alice was to encrypt all of the traffic she wants to send to Bob using her private key, 
and Bob would then use her public key to decrypt that traffic, but that's a computationally intensive thing. Uh, public key, private key, crypto takes more math than symmetric. So what we do is Alice generates a session key, and then she encrypts it in her private key and sends it to Bob. Bob uses Alice's public key off of her cert to decrypt that traffic, and then he has the clear text version of the session key that Alice sent, in this case, the green key. So if you take a look at the map, you know, Alice generates the green key, that's the arrow pointing to the green key, and then Alice's computer uses her the red key in her cert to encrypt that uh, payload of that session key and send it to Bob. Bob uses the public key from Alice's cert to decrypt that green key. Um, and then both sides use that green key to encrypt and decrypt the data that Alice wants to send to Bob, and that's the green flow. So at this point, uh, we're using that green session key to encrypt the data. Uh, it goes over to Bob's side. Bob decrypts it. Uh, the data is now in clear text again, and, and Bob consumes that data. After some amount of time, we decide it's time to rotate the keys. We've used the green key long enough, so we rotate the keys. So what happens is Alice generates a new session key. This is the orange key. And again, she encrypts it in her private, using her private key uh, from her cert and sends it to Bob, encrypted, and Bob uses again her public key to decrypt that, and he ends up with a copy of the orange key as well. And then they both use the orange key to decrypt the next batch of data. So in this case, Alice is now sending data with a new session key. And this can be going on for weeks, months, years, whatever. And we just have this long list of, of session keys, which uh, Alice and Bob sort of get rid of when they're done using them. There's no reason to keep those keys, those session keys around. But so this is great. This works. The problem is, is if Eve is an eavesdropper, um, and Eve is recording all of this traffic. Now, Eve might be a state actor. Eve might be just a, a hacker that somehow has gotten into your system and is watching your network links, etc. However, Eve is doing it. Eve is recording all of this data, and she's recording this and putting this into a, a data store. Importantly, what she's recording is both the session key exchanges, which are encrypted with Alice's private certificate key, and the data itself, which is encrypted by the green key and the orange key, the sessions. So she has both the exchange of the, of the private secret key as well as uh, session key, as well as the data that was encrypted by it. Over time, you can build up a very large pool of data that's encrypted by these things. But what you'll notice is all of those session keys were encrypted by Alice's certificate. And that's not changing all that frequently, if ever. So if Eve then later, say by a spear phishing email or something else, is able to get extract Alice's private key from her computer, you know, sends Alice a, you've just won an $8 million lottery, click here to collect your earnings, and instead what gets downloaded is a script that goes and empties out Alice's private key repository on her computer, Eve now has the red key. Eve can now go back into her data store, into her database of all those sessions, and decrypt all of the session key traffic, i.e. the red paths. And at that point, Eve now knows all the session keys, the green session key, the orange session key, et cetera, and she can decrypt all of the data that was encrypted with those session keys. So by getting one key from Alice, Eve can now decrypt all of the traffic that she's captured over days, months, or years between Alice and Bob. So the, the real risk here is if a long time ago Alice picked a bad certificate or at some point her key gets compromised, all traffic she's in, sent that's hung on that private key, that's, that certificate key, is now compromisable. So this is not perfect forward secrecy. It means that a mistake made in the past 
can be used to decrypt all data, not only up to that point, but beyond that point. So this is, and this is the way TLS 1.2 normally works. So this is why um, we get concerned about uh, key vulnerabilities, people getting spearfished, et cetera, because they're getting the sort of the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, that red key, which allows them to decrypt all the session keys and therefore decrypt all of the data. So how do we solve this? There is, we have all heard about RSA, um, Revest's algorithm, that's what's used for a lot of public key, private key, but there's another public key, private key technology, it came out about the same time, called Diffie-Hellman. Um, and Diffie-Hellman has a different way of doing public key, private key certification. So let's talk a little bit about how Diffie-Hellman works versus how, um, no, let's talk about how Diffie-Hellman works, might be an easier thing to do. So in Diffie-Hellman, we're going we're to treat this as a, uh, we're going to use paint colors as an example here. So in this case, I have Alice and Bob. Let's say Alice is at the top and Bob is at the bottom. And Alice and Bob both agree on some common data. Um, it is basically, two mathematical numbers. We don't need to talk about exactly what they are, but we both agree in advance and we don't care about that data, everyone in the world can know what those numbers are, and that's what we're calling common paint here. Um, I, I'd love to say I came up with this scheme for sh discussing how uh, uh, Dickie Hellman works, but this came out of Wikipedia. Um, it's, it's an interesting diagram of, of, of how it works. But then Bob and Alice both pick a separate private secret number. Uh, we're calling that a, a color here, it's a secret color. So Alice picks red and, and Bob picks green. And what happens is we then, Bob and Alice mix those paints or mix those numbers and combine the common paint with their secret color. And what happens is Alice ends up with a color orange and Bob ends up with a color blue. And Alice and Bob then exchange that paint color. So Bob then knows that Alice's uh, public color is orange and uh, Alice knows that Bob's public color is blue. What then happens is Alice and Bob again add their secret color but now to the other person's public color, i.e. Alice adds red to blue and Bob adds green to the uh, orange. Now, it's not really an add, it's another mathematical trans, uh, transposition, and it has to do with exponentiation and modulo, and if anyone wants uh, more data on actually how Diffie-Hellman works, I forgot to do this, I will put a link to a two and a half minute uh, video on how Diffie-Hellman works. I'll put that in the, um, as, as a link in the uh, talk after we're done. But what happens, given this mathematical, uh, a, a concept called transitive properties in mathematics, um, when you then combine the blue, when Alice combines the blue color with her secret color, again, red, she'll end up with brown. And when Bob combines um, Alice's public color, orange, with his secret color, green, he also ends up with brown. So independently of ever sharing their either private keys, their secret color, or anything derived from their secret color, um, they both come up with the same key. And they can now use that shared secret cut key, in this case, this wonderful brown shade, to encrypt traffic. The key thing here is that, pardon the pun, the key, the secret key to encrypt the data is never transmitted over the wire. It is always, the only place the secret key exists is with the uh, end user who generated the secret key. So we never put keying material on the wire, which means it can never be intercepted. So let's go to the next slide. And let's talk about how TLS 1.3 works using Diffie-Hellman. So we still have a certificate. We have Alice has a cert and Bob has a cert. And both Alice and Bob know about those certs. Um, and that's used purely so that Alice knows she's talking to Bob and Bob knows she's talking to Alice. Now, Alice wants to send traffic to Bob 
and Bob wants to send traffic to Alice, so they both generate um, the common data, uh, the common paint, and in this case, that's going to be uh, the blue, um, the blue data, and they can both do this independently, or they can agree on it. So in this case, from Alice to blue, um, dark blue um, hourglass shape, and on Bob, it's a light blue diamond shape. So they both generate that, and then they generate their secret. Uh, data or the secret paint uh, in the previous di in the previous discussion, and for Alice that's a uh, dark red hourglass, and and Bob is a light red diamond. So then Alice and Bob exchange the pri the public data, uh, the blues, with each other, and they don't even need to encrypt that because it's public data. They don't care who has that. All they use is their certificate to sign it to make sure that Bob knows it's really Alice that sent that blue uh, hourglass and that Alice knows that Bob really was one who sent the blue diamond. This prevents something called a man in the middle attack where Eve could sit in the metal and pretend to be Alice for Bob and pretend to be Bob for Alice and insert her own um, public data and be able to intercept the traffic. So we still use those certificates, those, T, those TLS or X509 certificates. It just, we're just using that to say that Alice really did send this blue uh, looking glass and, and the uh, Bob really sent the light blue diamond. So once Alice has Bob's diamond and uh, Bob has Alice's hourglass, Bob and Alice independently combine their secret data with the other person's public data. Uh, so in this case, uh, Alice takes and combines the blue, light blue diamond with the dark red hourglass, and Bob does it with the light blue red uh, diamond with the dark blue hourglass. When they do that, they both end up with the same, mathematically the same key. Uh, it's a purple key. And they now both use that purple key to encrypt and decrypt the data that they're exchanging in the purple flow. At some point later, just like with any other encryption, we assume more, the more data we encrypt with a given session key, is more likely that key might be able to be compromised. So at some point later, Alice and Bob go through this again, now with light blue I and mean, with, with blue and yellow diamonds and, and hourglasses. Again, signing the public exchange with their certificate to make sure that Bob is really still talking to Alice and vice versa and Eve is not in the picture. And now, once we combine those together, we end up with a green uh, encryption key and we then encrypt the next set of data with that green encryption key. Now, Eve is still there. Eve is still uh, capturing data and Eve now has captured the purple and the green key, and purple and green data. She has not captured the private keys, i.e. the red or the blue from session two or red from session one private um, keys themselves because they were never across the wire. So all she has is the session data. So now Eve has a much harder problem here. Um, the certificates, which are the long-lived encryption data on Alice's and Bob's computers, weren't actually used to encrypt the data. So even if she spearfishes Alice now and she gets the cert, she can't use that to decrypt the data um, that she has stored because those certificates weren't used to encrypt it. Normally, for session keys, the keying material is thrown away when you roll the key to the next key. So she might, Eve might be able to spearfish Alice while Alice is using the red private key and be able to decrypt the data she's collected, the purple data. So she spearfished Alice and, and got that key. But let's say Alice is rotating her key every five minutes or 40 minutes or whatever, or every 100 megabytes worth, megabits, uh, megabytes worth of data, then it's fine, Alice is decrypting purple, but within a short period of time, Alice rolls over to green, and now Eve doesn't have the key anymore, so she can't decrypt the green session. So this makes Alice's job much, much more difficult, because 
Alice can, Eve can only decrypt data if she gets the key while it exists on Alice's or Bob's machine, which is a limited time frame. If, if the implementation of Diffie-Hellman is set up correctly, those keys are destroyed in memory as soon as they're not being used. Maybe some bad implementations exist where that key hangs around longer on the system. That's, a, that's an implementation problem. But basically, even if she can, Eve can get that key, it's only going to decrypt that one session. So she's got to go through that effort each and every time that she gets a new session intercepted versus before she just had to get the red key from Alice's certificate and she, or the, uh, the equivalent from Bob's certificate and she'd be able to read all the data from that point forward. Worst case, Eve realizes, and Alice realizes that she's been compromised, she just rolls session keys and Eve's reading of the traffic stops. So this is a significant security improvement in TLS 1.3, and the, this is called, in cryptography, this is called perfect forward secrecy. So in this case, we've made it much, much harder for Eve to actually intercept, and, well, not only not intercept, but to decrypt traffic, and she can get much, only get much smaller amounts of data rather than the whole, the whole kingdom. So how does this impact IDS, IPS, uh, when you deploy TLS? So next slide. So, the big thing here is pre-perfect forward secrecy in TLS 1.3, or if you turned it on in, in 1.2, but that's not default. Um, prior to this, Alice and Eve could get all the data, even if she, if she collected the uh, TLS data from a whole bunch of streams across your organization. If she was able to get a hold of a key, she'd have all of the data. So it's sort of a large uh, vulnerability to have. We've now introduced perfect forward secrecy, which makes Eve have to get the keys for each unique flow. And if we're talking about a Kubernetes environment where there's hundreds of thousands of pods, each of them are TLS encrypting traffic, getting all those keys for every time those keys are rotated, say every five minutes or every 10 minutes, becomes a much harder task. So by adding TLS perfect forward secrecy in 1.3, we've made Eve's job much harder provided all the traffic is encrypted. She can't get all the data flowing out of, say, a large um, credit reporting agency or something along those lines. She's got to do this for each and every session off of each and every pod to get useful data. So basically what we're saying is we've really increased the security of your traffic in a Kubernetes cluster or any cluster using TLS with TLS 1.3, provided the data is encrypted and the keys are widely separated. And this is where we get into the conversation about deep packet inspection. Common models for doing deep packet inspection are that you would deploy to date a TLS proxy somewhere near your DMZ or your gateway. And that is the thing that is doing your TLS encryption as a proxy for all of the uh, elements within your infrastructure. So in this case, we've got two hosts, A and B, they each have two pods, A1, A2, B1, B2. And then we have a TLS proxy. It doesn't matter if this is TLS 1.2 or 1.3, but with TLS 1.3, we have a lot more security. If you take this approach, you just drove a large truck, actually more like a large ship, right through the center of the security that TLS 1.3 is attempting to provide for you. Because what I now do is all of my traffic, in order to, say, allow DPI, all of my traffic is unencrypted from the pods through the hosts all the way to the gateway. So first of all, Eve can now get in there and can decrypt, or not even decrypt, just capture all your traffic all the way up to the point of your gateway or even on the gateway. So she has a large surface area to attack and get unencrypted data. Worse yet, you've given the TLS proxy in order to make this work, 
the proxy keys for A1, A2, B1, B2, modify that by however many services and pods you have running, you have a lot of keying material in one place. Which means if Eve can penetrate that box, cross-site scripting, some other attack on that gateway, and she gets all those keys, then she can decrypt all of the traffic even after it's encrypted, because she had one place to go and she got all your keys, all your session keys, and she can then intercept the traffic at her leisure somewhere between you and the big bad internet and can decrypt all the traffic. So you put all of the key material for your organization in one place. It makes it a very, very juicy target for an attacker. So TLS 1.3 gives you a lot of session level of encryption and by doing this you've basically just blown a hole in that model and it's probably not advised. So there's another approach you can take that's been taken to date which is putting the proxy on each individual host. So in this case, now we show two pods. There might be 100 pods or 400 pods or 1,000 pods on a host or 80 pods. But there's some number of pods on that host. And all of the, everything on the host shares a TLS proxy on the host. <coughs> and in that case, you can do the DPI within the host well, in this case, because the traffic is unencrypted from the pod to the TLS proxy on the host. So now you do your DPI on the host, but we still have the same problem. Wherever you're doing DPI, Eve can now capture traffic. She's not capturing traffic from 100,000 pods like she would have if she caught it before it went to the TLS proxy, the centralized TLS proxy, but she's capturing traffic of, say, 100 pods if she gets onto the host. So she's still capturing a lot of traffic. More importantly, she can get the keys, if she breaks into that host, off the TLS proxy itself. So she now has the keys for 100 pods or 500 pods, however many pods are running on that host. So she still has a lot of keying material, which she can then use to decrypt traffic she's intercepted on the big bad internet. So again, you've created, now instead of a ship, you've driven a truck through the hole, through the protections that TLS 1.3 gave you. It's not as big a hole but it's still a, a big enough hole that it's you've sort of negated a lot of the benefits. So if you have TLS proxy on the host, Eve attacks that TLS proxy, gets the keys, and, and they can decrypt those green flows. So neither of these is particularly, you know, we're sort of weakening the protections we got. So now if we go to the next, the next slide, the option here, and this is sort of new as we're developing the capabilities of service meshing, uh, Istio, for example, and, and what we're doing at Tigera uh, with Istio on, you know, in the Kubernetes environment. This is sort of new. But what we now do is we put the TLS proxy within the pod. There's some advantage to putting the TLS code separate from your application code, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea is you take that TLS proxy and you put it within each pod. So now the only place that you can do DPI is within the pod itself. The interesting thing for that is that there are some interesting capabilities that can be enabled in service meshing um, to allow you to do that from within the service mesh. But once traffic leaves the pod, it's encrypted all the way. So DPI and therefore Eve's snooping on it isn't going to work unless she can get the keys um, because it's encrypted in TLS. And the keys are now spread across each and every pod. So for her to get all the keys to see your traffic, she has to break into, say, 100,000 pods across your infrastructure and dwell there because she has to catch every session key change. Because remember, we have perfect forward secrecy now. So every time we change the session key, she's going to have to get the new session key. So Eve is now going to have to dwell on all of your pods and all of your hosts and get into all of your pods and continually scrape out new keys. Uh, so that's a pretty um, serious level of penetration to your organization. And there's, if Eve can do that, she can do lots of other things in your organization. So by pushing the cryptographic boundary into the pod, we've dramatically increased Eve's level of work probably to the point where in most cases it's no longer worth her while to do this. And B, 
Even if she does it because we have perfect forward secrecy, it's only good for a period of time. If you evict Eve a little bit later, you find her and you evict her, uh, she's not going to be able to decrypt other traffic coming down the line later because her keys are, that she's captured her only session keys. So if we bring TLS 1.3, along with in-pod encryption of traffic, TLS encryption of traffic, and in-pod uh, access to DPI-like activities through the service mesh, you now have a very secure infrastructure that's very cloud native, um, if you want to think of it that way, keying materials widely distributed, um, it's ephemeral as part of the pod. You know, the pod goes away, the keying material goes away. There's no, keys never live anywhere. Um, you know, we have a much more secure environment by pushing that DPI boundary back into the pod and using TLS 1.3 with perfect forward secrecy to encrypt the traffic as it leaves the pod. Now, why do we want to do the TLS encryption in a separate proxy within the pod or anywhere else for that matter versus in the application? I'll take you back to Heartbleed. Lots and lots of code was written over the years that incorporated the open SSL library. And when Heartbleed hit, that meant that every application that used open SSL had to be recompiled with new versions of the library. And I'm sure some organizations might have missed a few of those. That's why we still have Heartbleed vulnerabilities even today on um, the public internet machines that are still, uh, services that are still exposed that way. However, taking the Kubernetes approach of sidecars and multiple containers in a pod, you could have a sidecar, like a service mesh like Istio, deployed in every pod and have that sidecar, that proxy, Istio proxy, have the envoy in each pod doing the TLS work. So when the next heart bleed comes along, and it will, because crypto is hard, you only need to fix it in one place. You need to fix it in the TLS proxy, which then gets redeployed into your pods, rather than going and fixing all of your application code and all the versions of the application code you have. So keeping this in one place is very useful to be able to adjust as, as cryptography, cryptographic requirements change or vulnerabilities are found, but we're doing it in such a way that we're still not creating a big, fat, juicy target that is going to have hundreds of thousands of keys and be susceptible to uh, uh, you know, forward decryption if those keys get compromised. So that's some of the thoughts. Um, and again, if you to reiterate, Push the encryption down into the pods. Do your DPI level type work if you can within the pod itself using some of the techniques that are available in a service mesh and love to talk to folks about that if that's something that they're interested in doing. Um, and you now have a secure environment um, that is going to take, make as full advantage, take as full advantage of use as possible of the security improvements we've gotten in TLS 1.3. So uh, with that, um, I think we maybe have a few customers, uh, a few questions. So that was a Freudian slip. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we dive into some of those questions? Well, I, excuse me, while I take yeah. a drink of water. Just a couple announcements oh. while Christopher gets a, a glass of water. There is uh, in the links attachment section, uh -huh. there is a link to our latest guide, which we just published last week, which is a guide to implementing network security for Kubernetes using both open source and commercial available software. Uh, so please feel free to download that. It's a great guide. And so um, if you signed up for this webcast, you already uh, have done all the work to sign up for the next one. You just need to go and say, I want to attend. And so it's in the Bright Talk interface. It's coming up next Thursday, and it will be about Kubernetes workload identity and uh, SEIM tools, okay, and relevance to those tools. So that's our next upcoming webcast. So without further ado, um, I think we will get to our questions. Christopher, can you, see, you can see the questions. Yeah, I can. Yeah. So the first question I've got, I, I see here, uh, do I still need the solution you mentioned? I'm not quite sure what that was in response to. So whoever, whoever asked that, if you're still online, if you can uh, clarify that question. Um, similarly, what if I'm using an N plus fabric model? Um, there are many ways I could interpret N plus. Uh, I assume you're talking about a multi service mesh fabric model. Um, if not, please clarify your question. But if you're talking about an M plus fabric model, 
um, a maybe multiple interfaces, something along those lines, you would need to do your encryption just like you would anywhere else um, at the entrance or exit point to each of the fabrics. Um, you complicate your life a little bit, uh, but it, the model, this model doesn't really change. Uh, if you have a single proxy, um, it's still vulnerable, whether if it's in one fabric or multiple fabrics. Um, if I take away slide eight, you have a service in it that manages several pods on different machines. How can you obtain pod level TLS security in that case? Depends on how you're, so that's a, the question is on slide eight, if we have a service that manages several pods on different machines, how do you obtain pod level TLS proxy in that case? So in that case, there's a couple different ways of doing it in the service mesh. Um, because, you know, services don't really manage pods per se, they expose pods. So you could still have pod level TLS uh, and different pods will be using different TLS certs um, for that service. Or the service mesh can impinge a TLS certificate, a, a TLS cert that's been set up for that service. If, for example, the service is using a virtual IP. So there's a couple different ways of doing that. We can talk uh, more about the pros and cons of that Mainly, do you want to have, do you want to be exposing the fact that there are multiple uh, answers for that service, or you want to make it look like there's a single answer for that service, i.e., one or multiple certs for that service? Um, obviously, the more things you have under a key, uh, the more risky it is, uh, but maybe the simpler it is for someone else to understand. So, is there some trade off there? Um, so, uh, can I also address some of the challenges of TLS 1.3 ephemeral Diffie mode Hellman key exchange? Uh, passive mode decryption will no longer be possible. Um, so, the I assume what you're talking about here is that we're and this is actually one of the advantages of perfect forward secrecy is you can't do passive mode decryption. Um, you'll no longer be, it will no longer be possible. All packets in the handshake after the initial client hello are encrypted. That's sort of the whole idea behind this. So if you want to decrypt your traffic, you have to get to it before it goes into, into the TLS proxy. And that's what I'm talking about, be it for whatever reason, DPI or whatever else, you're going to need to examine that traffic before it gets TLS encrypted. And the safest way to do that, as I was talking about, is doing that using some other mechanism within your service mesh or whatever, you're, if you're going to go down the service mesh route, before it gets TLS encrypted. So that's just a, um, uh, you know, the, the other big thing is that you're questioning here is presence of man-in-the-middle network devices in TLS 1.3. So Diffie-Hellman by itself does not protect you against man-in-the-middle attack because I need to trust that I'm receiving the public data from Bob if I'm Alice. I need to understand that it really came from Bob, otherwise someone can man-in-the-middle me. That's why you still uh, protect that data if you can through a TLS um, certificate. So basically you know, you know, client, you still can do client-side cert authorization, et cetera, so that Bob has a reasonable <coughs> under, um, level of, of, of trust that if it's Alice says, if, if, if this is supposed to come from Alice, it really is, and vice versa, and that's using digital signatures. Um, but man in the middle, Diffie Hellman in and of itself, the algorithm does not protect against man in the middle. You have to have some way of exchanging that public data such that you know it came from Bob or Alice, and that's where you would use your TLS cert. Um, and then, um, let's see what else we have here. Um, Nginx, oh, the Nginx fabric model. Um, Nginx plus fabric model. Um, sorry. So, it, I think the issue is still the same whether if you're using Nginx or you're using Istio, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a couple different ways of doing it with Nginx. You can do unencrypted into your Nginx proxy wherever that sits and then encrypt it out, or you can encrypt to the proxy and then re-encrypt, decrypt, and then re-encrypt out. 
my problem with anything where there's a um, in the middle transit device that either is getting clear text traffic and then sending out encrypted traffic or getting encrypted traffic, de-encrypting, decrypting it, and then re-encrypting it, re-encrypting it, is that box is an attack point. Uh, and it has all the keys that it needs to decrypt all of your traffic going through that box. It becomes a very juicy target, either A, for putting a uh, something that will capture the traffic while it's in its de-encrypt, decrypted state, clear text state, or capture the, the keys and then decrypt from elsewhere. So, you know, if you deploy Nginx uh, all the way down as close to the source as possible, and then it's no different than any other service mesh, right? Uh, I just used uh, Istio service mesh as an, as an example. Similarly, if you ran Istio with a middle proxy or an Nginx with a middle proxy, you still have the same issues. Um, so I think with that, um, we're sort of done. There's one or two other questions here I didn't have time to cover. Uh, we'll try and get to those um, in email later. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Mike to, to close up. But thank you very much for your attention. It was sort of dense material. I hope it was at least somewhat useful. Yeah, everyone, uh, let's thank Christopher, uh, Bob, and Alice, and, and, Eve. and Eve, and even Sally for all their hard work. Um, so thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, you can schedule a demo of Tigera software at this uh, the address you see on the slide, tigera.io slash demo. And uh, last but not least, uh, there we are. We are hiring at Tigera. So um, you see a lot of open positions. If you uh, are interested in joining us at a very exciting, fast-paced startup, doing some great work around uh, network security and compliance for Kubernetes and modern applications, please check out for a section. And, and one of those is a role that reports to me. I don't know if after you've heard this, you consider that a net positive or a net negative, but there are lots of them that don't report to me here either. So that's, that's <laughs> probably a good thing. Great. Well, hey, everyone, thank you for your attendance. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you at our next okay. web webinar, which is coming up next Thursday. Uh, all you need to do is go to our Bright Talk channel and sign up for it. And since you are here, it's just a one-click operation, so it's super easy. So once again, thank you for attending. <laughs>